voice today on the show. First time. Very yes. exciting. Very exciting. Carlos Cavazo, uh, some great news. He's part of uh, King Cobra. King Cobra's back. Good to have you, Carlos. Thank you for having me on your show. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. This is way overdue. I mean, uh, you know, Jim and I are fans going all the way back to the Choir Riot. And I'm wow. glad to see that you're, you're, you're 40 alive, years ago. You're well. Thank doing you, man. good. Yeah, we hit the 40-year milestone uh, a couple months ago when the album was released in uh, March, you know, of 83. That was 40 years ago last March. And wow. Crazy. And still out there making noise, I guess. You know, I never would have thought it would last that long, you know. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you got a new album with King Cobra, of course, with uh, the Apice or the Apice. Is it Apice? Carmine Apice, Alan? A piece, um, according to a Ron piece. Stewart. So. Yeah, a peachy, um, uh, a piece, an apathy. Yeah, okay, got I mean, it. They, 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 there's three brothers, they all pronounce their last name different. <laughs> Go figure. We Are Warriors is going to be released on August the 11th on Cleopatra Records. Um, and you're part of this new band, Carlos. Tell us, yeah, uh, you know, man. first of all, um, how'd you get involved? And, you know, what's the story behind that? Well, you know, I've done uh, things with these guys before in the past. I've done a few records with Paul Shortino, obviously, and uh, I've done a lot of gigs with Carmine here and there, and uh, we never did a record together, but I've always admired Carmine. He's a great drummer, great musician, great person to work with, and Paul's a great person to work with. I've always enjoyed working with him. And they contacted me one day and asked me if I'd be interested in maybe doing a song or two on the record. And I, I, yeah, sure. And then they ended up wanting me to do the whole record. So I ended up bringing some songs as well. Oh, okay. And uh, they had about half the record written before I joined. And I liked the material they were, you know, they are coming up with. And uh, I, I brought in, like I said, a few songs and it, here we are. Um, but I've always liked working with these guys. So I, I, I quickly jumped on the opportunity. I figured, what, what's there to say no about? They're all nice guys. I'm sitting around not doing anything right now. I kind of, you know, didn't really even want to be in a band anymore, or even tour anymore, but um, they kind of dragged me into it. But uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Twist yeah. your arm, force you into the band. Yeah. You know, and also there's Rowan Robertson on guitar on this record. And, you know, he, he did some good stuff. I, I think uh, uh, there's probably a little bit more of me on the record, but um, he did a lot of good stuff on it. And, you know, Johnny Rod as well. And then my brother played bass on Dance of the Wind. And, oh, wow. uh, I know what I was going to say. And Bob Daisley, he played oh. on, on one of the songs too. Uh, one More Night. That was Bob Daisley on bass. Yeah, that's Bob. one of my faves of the album. So Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I bet it was such a great pedigree. You know, is it, is it, you know, the name recognition is why they're using it as King Cobra or instead of calling it like Quiet Vanilla or... Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, right. Quiet Cactus. Lock like Up the Fudge or... <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It was Carmine's idea to re revive the King Cobra, which is cool. I always like King Cobra. They have some good stuff and they were good people. And, you know, it was a good band. And to be a part of it, you know, 40 years later, <laughs> I, I never thought I would be, you know, but, you know, it's fun. I'm, I'm having a good time with it. So, you know, you know listening to this oh, album sorry. and then going back and listening to the first two King Cobras, I think, you know, they're so different, those first two albums. I think this aligns itself more into the original album that was done oh, really? so many wow. years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, how would you describe this for the people? Okay, so we heard one song. I think there's one single that was released, right? Or is there two? I can't remember. We are warriors. We are warriors. We are warriors. How would you yeah. describe? How would you describe the, the the rest of the album to people who haven't heard it? Sort of like '80s style rock, anthemic sort of choruses, and you know, a lot of guitar shredding here and there, and uh, bluesy based edge in some of the songs. Um, there's a couple fast tracks, like one or two up tempo, and there's a lot of you know double bass drumming and cool, cool drumming. I like a lot of the, that in there, and uh, a lot of vocals and harmonies and stuff. And of course, Shortino, right? Paul Shortino, right. you played yeah. with uh, Rough Riot, right, for a short while. Rough Cut and plus, Rough Riot, Rough, rough Cut riot and plus riot. Quiet Riot Four, right? right. You guys, yeah. that's where you sure. guys probably you know had that connection, right? Um, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Go Alan, sorry. you still got the pipes, that's for sure. A Jeez. little bit more mature sounding, maybe. That... Right, right. Oh, yeah, he's always been a great singer. He's got to work with, fun to write songs with, you know, it's a no-brainer. You know? 
What about Rowan? I mean, is this, I guess I should ask this, is this going to be, you said you don't want to tour anymore or you do want to tour anymore. I'm not sure. But I mean, is this something you guys are going to go on the road with? Uh, we might, yeah, there's a possibility. Uh, we've been discussing that, but I think Rowan, uh, he's not going to be able to do it. He's pretty busy doing some other stuff right now. So we'll most likely use somebody else. And uh, as far as Johnny and Rod going out on the road, I'm not sure about that. It depends on what he's up to. Everybody's got so much stuff going on nowadays, and it's hard to round everybody up and get everybody out there. But um, we'll, we'll see what happens. We're hoping uh, – I would like to do maybe a few shows. Just maybe not a hardcore tour. We were out for a long time, but maybe just a few specialty festivals and stuff like that, you know, a few shows here and there. M3 Festival or yeah, Rock Oklahoma. Be cool. like sure, that. sure, yeah. sure. And we have to talk about Carmine. I mean, you know, he's going to be turning 77 years old in December of this year. And the drumming on this is, you know, he's hammering away throughout the whole album. What do you, what do you oh, think sure about Carmine? What's your oh, yeah, thoughts on, you know, him at his age doing this? Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's he's definitely a workhorse, man. He's he's uh, got it going on with the drums, and he's always been a great drummer, songwriter, singer. He's a great singer, too. Yeah, this is the first album that I, I didn't sing on this record. And this is the first time I ever did in my career where I didn't sing on it. And him and and uh, Paul did all the vocals on it, and they're great. You know, he, Carmine's a good singer, really. He did a, a lot of the vocals on BBA album, you know, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back in time, when you and Paul met, was it was it, was it in Quiet Right 4, or I guess it was before then you guys played with them at shows uh, and the Sunset Strip? I guess wrote rough cut. It was it was it back in the Choir Riot days where you met him? Uh, before he yeah, did Choir Riot, I met him in the probably mid 80s, uh, 84, 85. And I for sure, you know, obviously we met everybody when we did that We're Stars album. Oh yeah, Hearing Aid, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Hearing Aid. Uh everybody got together for that. And um, that's where I met a lot of people. And that was like 85, I think. So I think I met him in 84, a little bit before that. When you were there. I mean, how much did you participate in that song of Hearing Aid Stars? It's a great song. I mean, um, was it limited or they just had the set amount of people that were going to do it? They already had it mapped in their head or what was that like? Well, that was uh, the genius of Ronnie James Dio. He orchestrated that whole thing along with uh, Jimmy Bain and, uh, you know, the other people that were in his band at the time. Um, they they uh, had, I participated in the harmony vocals and the guitar solo, the rhythm playing was other people but um they had it all they had everybody come in just lay a bunch of stuff down they used what they wanted to use you know and uh that's how it came about but um yeah i participated in the, the harmonies the day they had everybody singing together like a choir that was pretty funny that's the photo on the cover of the of the thing of this you know the album but the guys from spinal tap were there as well so <laughs> yeah right yeah they were standing right next to me too i got to talk to them all day and stuff they were cool people, really cool people. Yeah, and I remember, you know, Carlos was one of the 300 solos that were performed on that album. And uh, <laughs> right, remember right. the video that came out, you were there yeah. playing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when when you, nice. and I guess you met Paul Shortino there, mm -hmm. and then this whole Kevin thing, right? I'm a huge Quiet Ride fan there, and I'll prove it. I'll prove it. I'm not, I'm not just saying that. I can I'm not just saying that. that. Like, no, not to say that everybody doesn't have this one, okay? But right. I'm just going to show you here. I go, I go hardcore. I go hardcore. Oh, oh yeah, the ones with Randy. I go real hardcore. I go real yeah. hardcore. This is oh, this is pre Carlos choir, right? right here. Sure is, yeah. And then you know we have this, you know, this guy here, and then uh -huh. we got this one he's here. Cool. He's got oh, the more. He's, he's a huge fan. fan. Holy crap! I got even the reissue yeah. of this. Look at that. Oh yeah, all right. Alive and well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then this bootleg, I'm sure you've seen a lot of money out of this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. Is a <laughs> going going back to the original album, and it's going to tie in with Spencer and Choir Ride Four. You know, I, I read so much about the original album, and mm -hmm. was it was Spencer Proffer? I mean, great producer. It's probably one of the greatest metal albums, you know, to be released at least in the top twenty. Right there, it is. I, I, I believe so. <laughs> Did Spencer really have his hand in all the songs? Uh, did he did he also divvy up the money? There was no money at the end of the day, even though that album sold like five or six million copies. I don't know what they did with their money, but I got money. I, I got okay. <laughs> so you got paid. 
I don't have to work anymore. I can retire right now. You know, I don't know what they do with their money. There was money. We got paid, of course. Okay, know. okay, good, good. Everybody's good, got good. different things with their money. I don't know. But um, yeah, Spencer was a good producer. He wasn't a metal producer. I don't think he ever produced any metal bands until us. And, you know, he, he was good for us. So he really was. He got the best out of us. And he knew what would work with us. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it... Uh, if we could have lasted a long time with him, but in the early stages of our band, though, he was good for us. He really got the, I thought he, you know, made us do really, you know, got the best out of us pretty much on that. Yeah, and at that stage, it's probably you guys are willing to sign with anybody and do anything just to get recorded. We, right. right. Uh, we got been turned down by a few labels and, uh, you know, they didn't want to give us a chance and uh, Spencer decided to, and we got lucky with that. So. It's, it's like, you know, winning the lottery, I guess, a little bit when you get a record deal. You know, even though you get a record deal, you don't know that your record's even going to do anything. You might go out there and it just doesn't sell and you can go back home with your tail between your legs. But, you know, we it's like winning the lottery. If you get a hit album, we had the right song at the right place at the right time. You know, And actually, to, to your point, it didn't take off right away, that album. That was, not, a, that was right, a slow. No. It, took a, it took a while to get up there, right? We, was, we pushed it and we toured hard and... Uh, Thankfully, with the cooperation of our label and a lot of the people that worked with us and stuff, you know, that promoted our record, it helped for sure. And MTV probably helped. That yeah, came out. Sure, right? That was a, that was the best timing ever, right? When MTV was exploding, you know, right? It was, it was, right? They exposed and, you to a wide variety of people that probably wouldn't even no, normally look at watch your video or something. You know? Well, I mean, if you look at the songs, I mean, you you really contribute a lot to this album, especially with the uh, mental health. That was a snow song originally, correct? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was a song that me and my brother had originally written called No More Booze. And uh, Kevin really liked the song, and he used to see us play it in the clubs, and he'd come down and watch us. And when we got together, uh, he wanted to work on that, so I rewrote the music to it. Basically kept the same chorus and rewrote the verses, and then Kevin wrote all the lyrics. And the term Bang Your Head actually came from Randy Rhodes. Uh <laughs> Um, me and Kevin were hanging out one day and Randy had called him on the phone from Europe and, and he was saying, yeah, there's these kids out here that are banging their heads like crazy in the front row. They're called headbangers. And that's when the term first came up. And, and, and he was going, headbangers, I like that. They're called headbangers. And then after he got the phone, Kevin wanted to use it. He goes, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to name their song Bang Your Head. I go, Are you sure? That's kind of a stupid name. I don't know about that. Go see what I knew. And uh, he, he ended up calling it Bang Your Head and it became what it is, you know. Was it true that Spencer, one of the caveats of you signing with him is you had to record a Slade song, the Slade song, Come On, Feel the Noise? I don't know if it was the, the deal breaker, but he, you thought that Kevin sounded like Naughty Holder, which he, I don't know if he sounds exactly like him, but he does have that style of Naughty Holder. And he thought that song would be a good song for us because it was a hit in Europe, but I guess it wasn't a, a big hit in America. And so we recorded the song and uh, we recorded the other one at the same time. And then we ended up using Come On, Feel the Noise. And So, so Mama, Mama, you were all crazy now that was recorded yeah. the same time as Come uh, On, Feel the Noise. Around the same time, maybe a little, a couple months after. So. And Don't Want to Let You Go, that was another a snow song? Yeah, that was a snow song. And so was uh, Breathless. And... Uh, I don't have the album in front of me. I don't remember the names. Well, I do. I do. Lucky enough, <laughs> I have it right here. <laughs> well, Battle Axe has to be one of that. No, yeah. Bla Slick Black Catalog was from the Randy Rhodes era, right? Which yeah, Kevin, Kevin wrote that. Kevin Fra Randy Frank, wrote that. Yeah, Frankie said he really liked that song. Let's bring it onto that album. So yeah, I like that song too. And actually, a lot too. of the, the leads licks in that song was, was what Randy originally did. They sounded so good. I didn't want to change them, you know, so I left him what he did. Did you, did you ever meet Randy like Rhodes? Oh, yeah, many times. Uh, he was always a real nice guy, no ego. I didn't see no rock star ego in him at all. And, well, you know, we just have small talk backstage. We did shows with Quiet Right a few times, Snow did. And uh, he'd come into our dressing room and talk to us and me and check out my guitars and stuff. And we'd have small talk kind of thing. And I, we weren't good friends. We just pretty much see each other out in public. And I almost got to jam with them because I remember uh, Snow went to this party in Burbank one time in their early late seventies. 
And uh, there was a, a band playing there, but everybody was getting up and sitting in and jamming. And then I see Kevin and, and uh, Randy come walking in, and uh, they were sitting in the back of the room or something like that. I was like, come on, you guys, get up here. They didn't want to do it. I think maybe they were a little buzzed from drinking or they didn't feel right or something. I don't know. But, uh, and I, so I didn't get to jam. I almost got to jam at Eddie Van Halen once, too. He came oh. down the show with snow. He came down. I asked him, do you want to sit in with us? He, he didn't want to. He refused. I don't know. wasn't into it. <laughs> You know, I, I love your guitar tone. I think that's what stands out the most on that album. You know, well, your thank solos. You, so much. You, you know, I think you're you're kind of like the most underrated, underappreciated guitar in the Sunset Strip. I, I don't know. It's I don't know why, but I think you know you played a huge role. Your your guitar. You know, you got a little bit of Randy there. You got a little Eddie Van Halen there, but you got your own thing going at least in sure, terms sure. of tone, right? And I think you, you did right. a great job. And you're you're like the well, quiet guy. You were like the quiet guy. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, what. pretty much. I was the quiet guy in the band, pretty much. But, uh, <laughs> you know. Well, I don't care if I'm underrated as long as I'm not underpaid. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's what it comes down to. Well, but I, knew it, I meant it in a nice way. Checks clear, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, did you feel like did you get once the album was completed? Metal health, and if, I hope you don't mind me asking more questions on this. That's whatever you want. When you had that, did you think this album was going to be as big as it was? And I mean, 40 years later, this is probably, you know, a, a huge album. It's just like everybody's got a piece of this album. Uh, none of us ever thought it was going to be this big and last this long. You know, um, I, I my confidence in the record wasn't really strong at first. I was thinking, I don't know about some of these songs, but I guess somehow as a package and the songs that we had as the hits in there worked and at that time. You know, I don't know if they worked today, but it did then. And, and what about Chuck Wright? He's in, he's out. I mean, that whole, <laughs> I interviewed Chuck. I've interviewed Rudy. I mean, right. did he, was he, he was in Dubro. He transitioned right. to Quiet Riot, but I guess because Rudy was part of the original Quiet Riot, right? That's kind of why he was transitioned back into the band, correct? Yes, you're right. Uh, originally, Chuck was in Dubro, and when Randy and Rudy were in Ozzy, uh, and then Randy had his tragic accident. Uh, Rudy wanted to come back to Quiet Riot. He didn't feel comfortable in, and I'm thinking, my, my personal opinion, he probably didn't feel comfortable in Ozzy anymore without Randy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's what really happened, but anyway, he, he came back to Quiet Riot, so we, we told Chuck we wanted him to come back, and we let him go. And so Rudy came back, but and, and before Rudy came back, Rudy had, you know, I'm sorry, Chuck had already recorded a couple of the songs on the Mel Health record. So we and they were already mixed and everything. So we left him on there, and then Rudy did the rest of this album, other than two songs, I think it was. Yeah. And right. um, yeah, Ru Rudy probably was a better uh, fit for that band for what we're about. You know, that was you know, I, I kind of liked it in the documentary. I'm sure you've seen it, where Chuck goes, "Well, I'm on this album. I'm on the first album. Look, look, my name's there. My name's there." I think that's one of the funniest moments. I even told Chuck yeah. that. I think that's hilarious. Yeah. When you yeah, that's funny. Well, yeah, we, we've always liked Chuck. He's a great bass player and a great singer, and uh, he always fit into the band. But, you know, I guess Rudy was the original guy. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I guess, you know, you're, you're, you got this huge success. Was it success too fast? Was it just too much, too quickly, that you could never top, you know, the second album, which was Condition Critical? Was that the case? Yes, Kevin was mouthing off. You know, I, this is this people that we've we've read about this many many times, right? But mm -hmm. was it was it more success over exposure, perhaps that's the right word, that was going on, which led to sort of like the the sort of the decrease in sort of sales and ticket sales. Well, my my opinion is uh, we had that major success in the first record, and when we went to do the second record. That's when Spencer was kind of being a little bit of problematic. We'd bring in all these songs, and I don't like none of these. Go back to the drawing board right again. You know, we saw another year or so. He should just let us be what we are, like we were on the first record. You know, and we probably could have maintained a little longer than we did. Um, because sometimes when you have that kind of success, all these people come out of the woodwork. Well, you guys should do this. You guys should do that. You got how about just let us be ourselves? You know, that's what... That the, the mental health album was the songs that we were just being ourselves, playing the, in the clubs all those all that time, you know. Nobody telling us telling us what to do. But um I think that had a little bit to do with it. And 
obviously Kevin, you know, doing his thing. Uh, he was, you know, very egotistical guy, and he was really, you know, hard headed about his career and anything that bothered him, he would mouth off about it. And and I I respect that he's, he 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 loves his career that much. He fights for it in such a way that maybe pisses people off. But uh, there, unfortunately, and back in those days, there there was no uh, you know celebrity rehab or whatever that, whatever that is called. You know the to iron out things with the press and stuff. But um, yeah, that was part of the problem that, and uh, also the, you know, not letting us do what we want to do. And, and also the third thing that you mentioned, maybe overexposure, you know, that could be it. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember. Well, it's it's funny because I see a parallel, like you just said, in King Cobra's second album, Thrill of a Lifetime, which sounds nothing like the first. And he Mm -hmm. said, oh, that's the way you got to go in the second album. You got to do these types of songs. Right. And that was Spencer like, Proffer. That was Spencer Proffer. Yeah, it's though. the same same kind of recipe that they had for yeah, Fire yeah, Ryan. You know, yeah, he increased that record. It's it's a touchy situation. You gotta I don't know. It's like it, you don't know what's gonna happen. You really don't. But then you had Kick Axe, who he produced yeah. as well <laughs> right. of their first album, and then their second album, it started all sounding a little too commercial. So uh-huh. I think I think 85, 86, there was a lot more hair metal, a lot more melodic stuff, a lot of more reverb, right. a lot more polished. And I you guess that's what probably. everybody wanted to do, right? To, yeah. Then this, then this guy came rock. out, right? Corporate rock. That's guy, like our version of corporate rock. I guess. When you think <laughs> back to Quiet Riot 3, what do you think? Uh, too, like I said, too corporate rock. We should have just been ourselves and not tried to be too polished and too perfect and you know, all that. There was a phase in the 80s where everybody was doing that. It was too polished and, you know. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I I think I agree with you. I mean, I think this is actually a, a really good album, but maybe just too slick and it kind of it, it is. It's a good record. It's, it's got good songs. Songs. It does. It does. Uh, but like too slick, maybe overproduced. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then of course, you know, things started falling apart. Then what? You left Kevin in like a hotel room, saying, "Okay, look, Kevin." <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I, I mean, how true is that story? Tell me how true that story is. I, I uh, need to it know. is true. It's it, indirectly my fault. Because when we had oh, it's our your podcast, fault too. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it it was my fault indirectly. I didn't mean to do this, but what happened was, uh, you know, our tour manager. We were we were in the hotel. All the the hell went down, and our tour manager came to me and he goes, uh, you know, here's your airline ticket. Everybody leaves at uh, twelve noon. And I go, oh please, can you get me home earlier? I just want to get the hell out of here. Can you get me on an eight eight a.m. flight or seven a.m.? And he goes, okay. So he switched me earlier. And then everybody else got word of it. Oh, we want to go home early too. We want to get the hell out of here. And so everybody got, uh, you know, switched. And I think he switched Kevin and he, but Kevin was passed out and didn't get the memo and he slid the tickets under the door. He didn't get it. And he was like, maybe had a hangover or something. And he woke up and everybody was gone. You know? <laughs> so, and then the story became the big, yeah, they just left me in a hotel room, right? Yeah, right, right. It, it wasn't intense. We wouldn't do that to the eye, even though we had a, a little falling out, whatever. We're not going to leave somebody behind. For me, Carlos, Kevin has always been the voice of Quiet Riot. From the he end. is without without him, there's no Quiet Riot. There's, you, you know, there's I, I agree. And uh, you know, for a guy who's loved Quiet Riot since I was a kid, uh, yeah. you know, even even the versions today, it, it's you know the songs are good and all, but I don't know. It just it, there's I don't know. I agree or not, you could answer that or not. But I mean, Quiet Riot today without Kevin is. It's not quite know. right. You know, Kevin had a distinguishable voice that you, you know it's quite right when you heard him. You know, you can totally and, and, tell. And, and, yeah, and I'm not going to say the songs are bad or anything. It just doesn't. It's not quite right for me. At no, least, you know. probably not quite right without me either. You know, me and Kevin were really the 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 ones who wrote all the music for that band, and you know the sound was ours. And did did they ever call you back saying, "Come on, Carlos, let's do this"? Because. Hmm. I, I think I've heard from a lot. I've seen a lot of posts saying, mm-hmm. bring back Carlos, bring back Carlos. Bring, that's all you see is bring back Carlos. Cause it'll give a little <laughs> more legitimacy yeah. to the band, right? To the, right. to the, the, to the name. I mean, does it ever cross your mind saying, you know, I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. And I know everybody's asked you this question, but I'm going to ask right. you it. Cause I want to know. Well, to be honest with you, they haven't asked. Oh, wow. So, it's a political thing, you know, and mm. uh, I don't, I don't think I would do it anyway. I I don't even want to be in a band anymore, to be honest with you. And uh, the projects that I'm doing now, I enjoy doing them. And I like, uh, I'm still recording and writing songs with people. 
Uh, but as far as touring and being in a band, I don't know about that anymore. I'm just kind of over it a little bit. But um, as far as being in that band, uh, for sure, I know. I mean, I already jumped off that crazy train once. I'm not going to get on it again. You know? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the new album, you know, We Are Warriors. And yeah, I got I got my top three side by side. Maybe you can just add a, a few comments uh, side by side. I mean, for me, that's got that classic 80s feel like you said earlier. So. Yeah, that's a really good song. Um, uh, that's a song that they had come up with before I was in the band. They had like about four or five songs before I came in. But um, yeah, I, I like all the songs on that record are really good. I like Turn Up the Music. Did you say that, Alan? Which was the one you just mentioned? I didn't. I didn't the side, by side, side by Side. Side by Side. Yeah. Side by Side. I like Turn, Turn Up the Music, music because yeah. it reminds me of the 80s and it reminds yeah. me if it, it kind of feels like that's the type of song that if you had the big massive budgets you know the record company right. would have pushed it on the radio and right, it could have right. been like a big hit <laughs> on the radio i have to mention another project that i just worked on um uh i got a call from the band freak show who, oddly enough frankie had worked with about 10 15 years ago or so but it's the band that jeff labar was working with uh, oh, before he passed yeah, away yeah, yeah. Jeff Labar from Cinderella, yeah. and they contacted me actually through my wife and asked me if I would help them finish their record. And I, I listened to the material. I said, send me the material. I'll check it out. And I, it was really good song. So I told them I would do that. And I, I just finished up that record, too. That's coming out soon, a freak show record. Good. Where have you been for all these years? I mean, okay, I know you're doing uh, a little well, stuff here. Have you, yeah, were you like just home. fed up? Were you just like fed up of the music? You're tired, he said. I kind of am. I kind of am a, a little <laughs> bit. But uh, the last time I was uh, doing anything was with Rat. We we toured in 2017, did all kinds of festivals and stuff. And then the, the band, you know, they, they decided to fire Warren for whatever reason. And I said, I can't do this without Warren. I mean, I don't want to be in a band with a revolving door of musicians like Quiet Right Hat. I'm not going to do that again. So I left. And so I haven't done anything since 2017 other than Rough Riot, which we only did a couple shows, no recordings or nothing like that. So I've just been home, hanging out with my wife and my, my pets and taking care of the house and things like that. And then also then I got the call from King Cobra and Freak Show. So I've been working on those two records and writing and stuff like that. And uh, again, I must say that these are the first two records I ever did in my career where you don't go to a studio with the whole band and record as a band. You know, I did it at home in my one of my bedrooms in a computer. You know, I just send the file to the producer. Yeah, that's that's right. what the world is about these days. It's all digital, yeah. you know. You guys know that. So the King Cobra album and the Freak Show record, I did I did that way. I recorded anything that I heard into the song. I send them all the files and they use whatever they want to use and, and they produce it. And, and, and I did the video, um, when we did the Freak Show video, they flew me up to do a video on a soundstage, but the King Cobra video was done individually because everybody lives so far away from each other. Right. And so I had to go to a, a, a studio, they had a big green screen, and I had to sit there and do the video by myself. And like, this is like, there's no camaraderie like it used to be. Like, come on, bros, let's have a beer and cut the phone. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you're by yourself. It's really ridiculous. It's like, <laughs> Well, you know, one thing I noticed about We Are Warriors, the song, and that's the video you're referring to, that's like a quiet ride song. There's even little lyrics in there. I wrote that song, yeah. yeah. You, yeah. you wrote, wrote the lyrics to that song, too? That's and a no, great song. I wrote the lyrics, I wrote the music. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> I, I hear that guitar tone. That's the quiet ride guitar tone, that lead yeah. that you're playing. And right. I, I'm pretty sure it's almost you that's playing the, this, that that lead there on that song. Uh, yeah, on that song, I'm doing all the solos, yeah. Yeah, and very impressive. I, I like that a lot. Thank you so what else? Much. What other songs did you like, Alan? I, I Secrets and Lives. I just love the drumming. Oh, the Secrets and Lives. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the good drum figure in that one. Yeah. 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 And One More Night, for me, that's, you know, if you continue on a second project, and I hope you will, I think One More Night is probably the, the sound that I would define the band I, off this right. album. Yeah, that's a good song. A very good song, yeah. But that's one guys, you, oh, yeah. yeah. I think you forgot Love Hurts. You know, that's a oh, cover, yeah, that's, that's the Nazareth cover, cover of a cover, right? So, yeah, um, yeah, right. Man, you guys, at first I go, Love Hurts, and now they can't pull it off. You, you know, you can't, you can't <laughs> do it as good as Nazareth did that cover. But, uh -huh. you know, you did a great job. Uh, you know, but, yeah, that was Paul. Rowan. Rowan did the first solo, and I did the tag out solo at the end. And yeah, that's Paul what I was going to ask you. Who decided to do, you know, your two great guitars? Who decides to, to, how to split up the solo? Um, well, I would play the solos wherever I heard them, and they just use them wherever they want. 
And then some of them they already had with Rowan on it. So I didn't touch that. I just did the parts he didn't play on. Yeah, it is a tough decision, sure. <laughs> so what other projects do you have going on? Uh, that's, that's it for lot. now. Uh, okay. Yes, a lot. Um, that's a I'm lot. sure some stuff will pop up. I usually don't have a problem getting gigs, thankfully. I think my lucky stars. You know, I uh, I guess people like working with me in this business. I hope so. But uh, I'm around and somebody else wants me to do some solos on your record. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you what? based out of, Carlos? Well, I live in Los Angeles, Northridge, California. Yeah, that, I asked him that question before you got oh, on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's okay. I'm just kidding. It's like everybody's either in Nashville or Vegas these days. So Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah, we, you know, we we have our house paid off. So if it wasn't for that, we'd probably get the hell out of here, too, because California is not fun to live here anymore. The crime is bad, and, and just the price of everything is so sky high, way higher than anywhere else. You know, you know, last time I was on Hollywood, at, at on Hollywood Boulevard, I couldn't believe, you know, the... Uh, the, the poverty there, or at least what seemed yeah, like almost, poverty. Almost gotten bad. Yeah. You're kind of scared to walk down the street. Not that I have anything against them. But you, are, you are. Yeah. It's scary. You don't know how these people can react. They, they could be nice to you, or they could all of a sudden pull a knife out you and try to chase you down. We don't know. It's, it's hit and miss. Hopefully our new uh, mayor of the city, Karen Bass, hopefully she she's vowing to clean up the homeless best she can. Hopefully it, it works out, you know, because she seems to be doing a good job so far, you know. It's it's been cleaned up in a few spots that I've seen it before. So, Carlos, I didn't ask you. Did you participate in the Choir Riot documentary? You know, I didn't. I was out of the band, and they called me up, and I. I it's like um, those guys kind of screwed me over a little bit. And after that, I was like, you know what? I ain't want nothing to do with these people or this band anymore. And I vowed to myself, I'm not going to ever do anything for that band, and I haven't for 20 years. People still think I'm in the band. I've been out of the band for more than 20 years now. Yeah. I think I think they love you so much. You know, they they love your contribution. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you've been on almost every single Quiet Riot album, right? With Kevin, at least. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, people value your 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 input, right? They value your your, your, your playing. I so. And I think as fans, right? We don't know what the business is going on. We don't know what the music business right. is going on. Right. But as fans, we kind of you know we always hope that the people that made us happy in our youth will continue, but it's not always the case. Right. I agree with that. I was the same way when I was growing up and I'd see somebody leave a band that I liked. Oh man, that's not good. You know, every member is important when you, when you're, they're your favorite band, you know, is it, is there anything they could do to sort of get you back into the fold? I, there probably could be some things we'd have to discuss them, but I don't know. It's like a marriage. And when you're in a band, it's like being married. And sometimes the marriage breaks up in a bad way and it's a bad divorce, you know, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's an amical divorce. It, it's you don't know what you're going to get. You know, and unfortunately, with Kevin and Frankie, they're so hard headed people. They're very unreasonable guys. They really were. And I'm an easygoing guy, very reasonable guy. And uh, well, me and Alan like, are here if you ever want somebody to broker the deal. <laughs> you can be my manager. <laughs> we'll sit here. We'll go. Well, what do you want? Okay, what do you want? What makes you happy? Okay, what, where can we find some common ground here? Well, but I, I, you know, if Frankie and Kevin were around today, I would come back. But without them, I don't think that makes it a no for me. Kind of, you know, yeah. why bother? Okay, that's yeah. understandable. Yeah, that's you know what understandable. I mean? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I Jimmy, don't wish Jim, any- By the way, Carlos, Jimmy does this with every band that's broken up. He tries to get them back. <laughs> that, <laughs> I, I understand that. You know, me and my wife, we talk about it. You know, that that show, John Taffer, Bar Rescue. Yeah. We think there should be a guy like that to reunite bands. And, you know, hey, that's and a good point. Guys that are misbehaving and get them in line and get this band working again right, you know. I, I don't know why they do that. It's like some, like some bands are an easy, easy money-making machine. They just can't keep it oiled well enough to be friends long enough just to get out there and work, you know, it's weird. Yeah, it is weird, but you know, there's a lot of politics <laughs> and yeah, yeah. That day. I, we, get it, we get it. We get it. Look, we're going to ask, we're going to ask, yeah. right? Because uh, we're fans at the end of the day. Right. Alan, okay. do you have anything else? We got King Cobra. That's, that's what we're working <laughs> on here. That's what we're focusing <laughs> Look, on. So. I, I've interviewed Rowan, uh-huh. uh, Carmine Car- or Carmen Carmine. or Carmine. Carmine. I don't yeah. know which one it is. I, 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 Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> I right. Uh, Kelly. Rudy Sarzo and right. Kelly Garney. I mean, Kelly Garney, Kelly Rudy Garney Sarzo, yeah. Frankie many times. Yeah. Uh, I think we've kind of went the whole circle. Never got to interview Kevin. 
Oh, I think wow. I, I think I would have enjoyed interviewing your, Kevin. I don't know if Alan would have enjoyed it, but I think right. I would have. Um, he's a good interview. Why. He's a good talker. That guy can talk. He, he he's got a lot to say. That's for sure. Did you have your show when he was alive, or you know what? I would Kevin. I think died in two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. No. No, 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 no. We started just after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's yeah, been yeah. Uh, away for sixteen years now. So oh boy. Yeah. I know. We've talked to everyone, including oh my god, what was that girl's name? She was your fan club, Kevin fan club. Uh, uh, uh Melissa, Missy Winnie, Winnie, Winnie. Yes, yeah. Talked about her book with Kevin. Yeah. Went through who Kevin was. You know what? To me, he seemed like a great character. A great interview. Uh, so what? So what? He he mouthed off a little bit. Like yeah, so right. many well, artists have mouthed off. Right. Well, he was a really nice guy. He really was a great person, but he had a dark side that would come out occasionally. And uh, he had a substance abuse problem. I, I'm sure everybody knows that. But, you know, I have to say that Frankie was his bad medicine. When Frankie wasn't around, Kevin was a good guy. But when Frankie would come around, also he'd get evil, you know. Wow. That's strange. Well, on that note. I don't think I've ever said that in an interview before. Maybe. Hey, there you a, go. There you go. Terror twins <laughs> or something. You, you know, we've interviewed Frankie before. Uh -huh. And he's always been polite. He's kind, yeah. and he was always thoughtful. And by himself, he was great. You know, there, there right. was. But I've never seen that dynamic because, again, you know, uh, Kevin, we never. Interviewed yeah, they're, they're both very strong A personalities, Kevin and Frankie. You know, I don't know if you guys know about A personality people, but they're they're hard yeah. to deal with. It's all about them, and you know. But I, I always yeah. find that Kevin got. It, they were sort of they were gunning for him. The journalists were gunning for him at the time in eighty four, eighty five. Yeah. I think oh, yeah, good, yeah. good copy makes good copy, and 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 sure. after struggling so long, Kevin didn't. That's what I took away from it at the time. Kevin was vocal about his success, and he well deserved he was, after yeah. years of struggling. Like you said, nobody wanted to sign you guys, and and they they let him talk. It seemed like, and the more he talked, the more they published. No, no, but what was what, what did he say that was so terrible? Like I, I have that article. I have that original article where he mouthed oh. off. You know, a lot there was of nothing. Time, he said he opened the doors. So big deal. He opened the doors. He did open the doors. Right. That's you not so bad. Doors. He would bad rap certain bands, like certain bands suck. This guy sucks. Or he would say stuff like that occasionally. And a lot of that has become because he, he, he had a hangover and he was in a bad mood. And then he, he <laughs> had to do an interview at six in the morning when he's hung over in a bad mood. And he'd, he'd say whatever comes, you know, he, he's a personality and a, and a personality people, whatever goes to their head comes out their mouth. They, they can't hold it in. That's that's Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. On that note. And that, sometimes you, you've got to hold things in. You can't speak. <laughs> But that's rock and roll too, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, to me, he, you guys did open the doors. Everybody, all yeah, the, all the record labels, people. all the record labels did sign bands after you guys had success. Cause You're that's right. how it always right. works. Yet he You're was right. punished for stating the obvious. And, <laughs> And I mean, if you want to listen to controversial oh, lyrics, you just oh, put on funny. Guns N' Roses. If you know, right, right, right. Well, he said a few wrong things at the wrong time, and it became a witch hunt, and then yeah, trickled down from there. I guess. I remember Ron Sobel said once that uh, his Jack Daniels was iced tea. Uh, you know, he really did drink. I know people think he's a big wimp, wimp or whatever, but he really did drink. He was a drinker, but during the show. When he had to sing, he couldn't drink the, the Jack Daniels because it'd mess up his throat, and and so he would just put tea in there to make it look like Jack Daniels. But he really did drink whiskey. He wasn't, you know. Actually, on, on on the last note, me and Alan were talking about the US Festival, and what are your thoughts playing in front of so many people? That was like you had Choir Ride, Motley Crue, Triumph, Scorpions, Van Halen, and Judas, Judas Priest. Priest and Ozzy. Triumph, you said Triumph too. Yep, yeah, try it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. We that was an amazing day. It really was an amazing day. Uh, we were pretty much a new band. We just started touring. Our album it just came out. We started touring with the Scorpions. They took us out. And uh, the the Us Festival fell like on the last day or two of their tour. I think we had like maybe two more shows to finish up after the Us Festival. But um, yeah, it was amazing. I, I never, that's still to this day the biggest festival I probably ever played wow. in my career. And to see all the, you know, 500, 600,000 people, whatever it was, it was like jaw dropping. It really was. And, uh, you know, they were hosing people off in the front to cool them down and carrying people away and topless girls in the front, all drunk and on people's shoulder. It was a nut. It was, it was crazy. 
A lot uh, of and, uh, pink and red everybody... flesh. <laughs> What's that? A lot of pink and red flesh. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, there, there was a, a, they had everybody's dressing rooms kind of near each other. So we got to meet all the bands and everybody saw each other. It was kind of cool. And uh, it, was, it was a really nice day. I, I would never forget that. It was, and, and a funny story, Warren D. Martini and Robin Crosby, I think it was them two, they, they went to the US Festival and they said that they were running in when Quiet Riot was playing. They wanted to see us play. They were running in or something. He told me the story about it. Oh, yeah. Some tongue or some words like that. Who stole the show at the US Festival? Oh, you know, I don't know. I would think, uh, God, I don't know. Triumph, maybe. They say it. Hoping. There he is. There it is. Yeah. There it is. That was a That's loaded what he, question. He was hoping you. I want to say Van Halen, but Triumph. They, they were they were really good, and the way they used their song in the in the documentary was really good. You know, it's yeah, a great documentary. Great documentary. Yeah. All right. That's pretty much well, it. Carlos, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Finally, well, and thank and, you so much. I'm sorry it took so long to get here. on your show. You look happy. You look healthy. That's all that matters, right? Uh, uh, how I old are you? I turned sixty-six just last month. Unbelievable! <laughs> look at look at me and Alan. We're only fifty-five. We're ready to look like we're ready to croak. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't know what keeps me young. I, I smoke pot. I don't know if that keeps me young, but I don't drink very lightly. I drink, but I just don't take life too seriously. I never took the music business too seriously. If you do that, you're going to look old before your time. You know. Um, I try to take care of myself. I don't eat all healthy food. I eat some junk food and some healthy food, but maybe mm -hmm. it's just my outlook on life. I don't know. Maybe good maybe genes. It's maybe it's the pot. Yeah, I'm Latin and American, so maybe my dad's next. My mom's American. Maybe that's something to do with it. I smoke lots of pot. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Oh, well, maybe <laughs> well, it's we legal here. Stop. It's legal here. <laughs> Uh, okay, We Are Warriors is going to be released on August the 11th on Cleopatra Records. That's King Cobra. They're back. I think it's the seventh. Their seventh album? Something like that? Seven. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Alan, correct me if I'm wrong. I think well, it's seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let you run with that. All right. We'll say it's the seventh. <laughs> on that note, thank you so much, Carlos. Always, uh, if you ever want to come back on the show, promote anything else, you're more than welcome to come on. Thank you so much for having me. It was great talking to you guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Carlos. Thanks, Kim. All the best.